Should the U.S. ban fossil fuel exports, as some other candidates are calling for? Well, I think, the, I think we should, in fact, depending on what it is they're exporting for the, what, what they're replacing. Everything is incremental. Everything is incremental. For example, you talked earlier about transportation. I've been pushing really hard for mass transit and for rail. We can take millions of vehicles off the road if we had high-speed rail. I've been a champion of that for the last 25 years. We know the Carters where we could do that. It would literally take millions of vehicles off the road. But you have to have a rail system that makes people say, if I get on that rail, I will get there as fast as I would have gotten had I driven. And I can afford to do it relative to the cost of my driving. There's a direct correlation. This is something I spent the bulk of my career on, trying to save Amtrak and a few other little things like transportation. But my point is that there are things that we can do now, now, that can begin to change the arc in a significant way. And as we, in fact, invest in the science and the technology and the changes that are available and will come to fruition, in fact, we can make it significantly better. Should it, at, will there be a point, or would you like there to be a point, and if so, when, that everybody drives an electric car or has to drive an electric car? Well, I think, look, that's going to be based upon whether or not we can make it economically feasible. And it is economically feasible. Because guess what? Everybody knows where the world's going. You're not just like, you know, we, 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 we set out the rules for what kind of plant, you know, coal burning plants. No one's going to build another coal burning. We've got to shut the ones down we have. But no one is going to build a new one. Guess what? They're not efficient relative to what else is available to be done. That's why people are going to move. And that's why it's going to create so many new jobs for us. We have to take, the, take combustion engine vehicles off the road as rapidly as we can. But that also can create a significant number of jobs and opportunities for people. Our uh, chief climate correspondent, Bill Weir, is here. I know he has a question for you. Thank, Thank you, Anderson. Uh, Vice President Biden, as we keep one eye on Hurricane Dorian uh, tonight, it's safe to assume that uh, an awful lot of folks in the Carolina Low Country are thinking about life and safety and probably insurance. Uh, there were 14 separate billion-dollar storms or fires last year, total of 91 billion, and it just seems they logical. Didn't break enough leaves. And yeah, right, right. But it seems reasonable to assume that at some point, insurance companies are going to stop covering places that are vulnerable, even in fire regions, as you say, as well. Um, but if that happens, it could tank real estate values, and it could gut out property values and the tax base that so many communities depend on. So as president, how would you be honest with the American people when it comes to the dangers of this without feeding into this kind of an economic spiral? Just like I did at home. My state is three feet above sea level, okay? Three feet above sea level in the southern part of the state, the whole Delmarva Peninsula. And guess what? We know what's going to happen if we don't make significant change. And so we'll be telling people, don't build in these places here. But what about the people the, that are already the there? The people who are already there are going to be in real trouble. They're going to be in real trouble because you're right. Eventually, what's going to happen is you're going to have insurance companies come along and say, I can't, I can't insure that. You know? Because the prospect that that is going to be blown away is overwhelming. And so we have to, you know, be in a position where when we build back, we don't build back to normal. We build back to what is necessary. And so there's a whole range of things that are going on now in terms of, you know, uh, anyway, I'm taking too long. Sorry. Uh, I, I want to introduce you to uh, John Cecil from uh, Phillipsburg, New Jersey. He's the vice president for stewardship at the New Jersey Audubon Society. John. John. Good evening, Mr. Biden. Um, across the country and around the world, individuals, families, businesses, we're experiencing climate change, the effects of it now. Yes. In New Jersey, where I live, we've had unprecedented rain in the last 18 months. In the South, we see these storms coming through. And in Midwest. the West, Western United States, the devastating fires. Um, so all of this is really disruptive to people, families, businesses. My question for you is a bit of a personal one. How has climate change affected you and your family? Where it's affected me and my family is I was raised in a little town called Claymont, Delaware. More oil refineries and Marcus Hook at that, and it, 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 it takes care of 10 million people. Prevailing winds are south and southeast. I remember when I was a kid getting up and going to school, the little Catholic high school, grade school I went to, and get in a car, and when my uncle would drive us up, it was the first misty day, turn on the windshield wiper, there'd be oil on the window. 
I don't know if that's why I have asthma, but I know that's one of the reasons why Delaware at one point was rated as having a disproportionately high number of cancer cases because of what was going on. That's why we pushed really hard to make sure that we, in fact, required mitigation to be taken on all of those plants, some of which we've shut down. And so it's affected my family in a way and my state in a way that's been real, more than it's affected Jersey, more than it's affected Jersey. And so I understand what's going on, but look at the Pine Barrens. You got a lot to worry about there in terms of fires and drought, but the flip of it is, look what's happened in the Midwest. We have a number of significant bases that relate, relate uh, military bases that relate to our national security that in fact were rendered almost useless, including, I, I can't go into the great detail to, to say it, but my, 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 my point is, it, it significantly reduced our national security. Last thing I'll say, first thing that happened when the president, when President Obama and I were elected, we went over to what they call and some of your military women and men, over to the tank in the, in the Pentagon, sat down and got the briefing on the greatest danger facing our security. You know what they told us it was? The military, climate change, climate change the single greatest concern for war and disruption in the world, short of a nuclear exchange immediately. And so where are we? Look what happened in Darfur. What's Darfur all about? Darfur is all about the fact that the sub-Saharan desert, because of the change in climate, no longer had enough arable land. Look what's happened in Indonesia. They're talking about moving their capital because it's going to sink. What happens if you get 10, 12, 13, 15, 100 million people on the move? That causes wars. And so it's well beyond whether or not it affects me personally, which it does, and it did my family and still does, just like your families. This is personal. This person, every one of you probably have a story that can talk about what's happened to something you care greatly about whether it's a species or it's your son or daughter coming down with cancer mm. because of it. So it, 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 but we can do something. We have to act now.